lecture this afternoon, and I would direct your attention now to one of our confessional documents, which would be the Heidelberg Catechism, a 16th century catechism. Uh, Lord's Day 51, I've been told you are at in your regular preaching, which lands us pretty much at the tail end of the exposition in the catechism on the Lord's Prayer, Christ's teaching on prayer. And so we ask and we confess there in question 126, what is the fifth petition? The answer is, and forgive us our debts. Old translations might say transgressions or trespasses, as we also have forgiven our debtors. That is, for the sake of Christ's blood, do not impute to us wretched sinners any of our transgressions, nor the evil which still clings to us, as we also find this evidence of your grace in us that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbor. And so far the reading of the Heidelberg Catechism. Well, dear congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, someone once remarked, and I think it was rather insightful, shepherds smell like sheep. Well, that was a comment that was made in the context of a conversation of, about church leadership. Uh, good shepherds, faithful shepherds, will regularly be among the flock. They won't simply be doing their perfunctory visits, checking some boxes, do the annual home visit, and that's about it. Uh, they don't manage the flock from afar or just from arm's length. No, uh, faithful shepherds, even if they're imperfect, so uh, good elders, good deacons, good pastors, they will willingly dive into the fray and they will jump into the mud and the blood and the filth of life in the flock. And the reason they smell like sheep is because they do that. They are among the sheep. Now, this isn't an insult. A shepherd who smells like sheep is really following the paradigm of shepherding and pastoring laid out by the good shepherd himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for the sheep, he says in John 10. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, Luke 19, verse 10, who came to seek and save the lost. So shepherds smell like sheep. Now that brings up a good question this afternoon. Uh, what do sheep smell like? Now if we're talking about the average domesticated barnyard animal, then it, it wouldn't be all that flattering to be told you smell like sheep. But we're not talking about that kind of sheep this afternoon. We're talking about the people of God. Our call to worship was from Psalm 100. We are the sheep of God's pasture. So here's what's interesting, and, and maybe it's a little bit dangerous when we begin mixing metaphors uh, like this, but I'm going to do it anyway. According to the Bible, believers, sheep, smell like Jesus, or they should smell like Jesus. The Jesus who laid down his life to redeem us. The Jesus who died on a cross to open up the way of salvation and forgiveness. Now, you just need to think of how our scripture reading from Ephesians, the tail end of it, uh, read. If you have your Bibles, take a look at that. We read in Ephesians uh, chapter, one, or chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, sort of a summation uh, of, of everything that's been said so far. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, a fragrant offering. Now, similarly, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the verses 14 through 16, which says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us, spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, and to one a fragrance of death to death and to the other a fragrance of life to life. Now, whether you realize it or not, all this talk about the fragrance of Christ to God or the fragrance as believers being the aroma of Christ to God We've actually been transported backwards in the Bible, smack dab into the Old Testament, in fact, into the books of Moses, in particular, uh, Leviticus chapter 4, uh, verse 27 through 31. Uh, and, and in those verses, we read about a special kind of sacrifice that uh, believers in Israel were required to offer in certain situations. 
Leviticus 4, 27, it says there, if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without blemish for his sin which he has committed. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering. So this is a symbolic transference of, of guilt from the sinner onto this scapegoat, onto this sacrifice. And then he shall kill the offering in the place of the burnt offering. And the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out all the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. And all its fat shall be moved or removed. And as the fat is removed from the peace offerings, and the priest shall burn it on the altar for a pleasing aroma to God. And the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be forgiven. So the fragrance of atonement, the fragrance of forgiveness, the fragrance of grace, in Leviticus 4, uh, verse 31, and, and really the entire Old Testament, a sacrificial system when you think about it. Uh, if you turn all the way in your Bibles back to Genesis 8, verse 21, uh, this is when, Moses, or when Noah uh, exits the ark after the flood, and one of the first things he does is he offers a sacrifice. In chapter 8, verse 21, we read something similar. There's this pleasing aroma that rises up toward heaven, and, and God says to himself, he's never going to destroy the world again with a flood. So the sacrifices are these pleasing aromas to God, uh, aromas of forgiveness, a fragrance of forgiveness. And so if we're going to paraphrase Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, really we could say that Jesus smells like forgiveness. He is a pleasing aroma to God. Well, the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, along with passages like Ephesians 5 and 2 Corinthians chapter 2, they draw a direct link between the fragrance of Christ, so our forgiveness in His blood, and the Christian vocation, that's just a fancy word for calling, to sacrificial living. And that sacrificial living, if you think of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that becomes an aroma of Christ, which is pleasing to God, which is carried everywhere we go in all of our conversations and in all of our relationships, the aroma of Christ. So we could push this a little further this afternoon, maybe in, in simplified terms. We could say, well, if Jesus smells like forgiveness to God, then believers who are united to Christ by faith should carry the fragrance of forgiveness wherever we go. So here's a question for all of us to reflect on this afternoon. Do you smell like Jesus? Is your lifestyle fragrant? Is it a pleasing aroma to God in Jesus Christ? Or, or does your life, your words, your actions, your thoughts, your relationships with others, does your life actually release this wretched, putrid, pugnacious, awful odor? Because it's rising up from a rotting and sinful heart. That's what Jesus said is the root of sin in, in Matthew 15, the verses 19 through 20. He got into this argument with the Pharisees about their ancestral tra traditions and uh, hand washing and all this sort of stuff. And Jesus gets very annoyed and, and he corrects their, their notions about what truly causes uncleanliness. And he says in Matthew 15, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, witness, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. It really shouldn't surprise us that according to the Bible, the fragrance of forgiveness features large. It, it, it's fundamental to the Christian life. If it's through the fragrance of forgiveness in Jesus Christ, through his life and through his death on the cross, that sinners like you and me are, are reconciled to God, then wouldn't it follow that it is through the fragrance of forgiveness wafting over our lives that sinners can be reconciled with other sinners. 
Now, these aren't unrelated concepts at all. The Bible often connects these two things together. Think of how the Lord Jesus summarized the law. In fact, it's not just the law. He summarized the law and the prophets, which is a shorthand way of saying this is the summary of the whole Old Testament or the whole Bible. And he says what? Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as your health, uh, as yourself. So there's this vertical element of loving the Lord that's based on Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. And then there's this horizontal element of how you interact with other image bearers in this world. Now, many Christians have often said that the way you love your neighbor or, or the way you don't love your neighbor can really function as a barometer for the condition of your heart and for your standing before the Lord. Now, this is, this is a biblical concept. I'll turn your attention this afternoon one more time to the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. And this bites for a lot of us. If anyone says, I love God, and we all say that, don't we? But hates his brother, he is a liar. What's he lying about, hating his brother, or is he lying about loving God? I think it's the former. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You can't love God and hate your neighbor. And the commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So they're connected. They're two sides of the same coin. Now, in Matthew 18, Jesus tells a parable that, that really does seem to put a lot of teeth to John's words, uh, and it's a challenging parable to read, isn't it? It's challenging for a whole host of reasons. Uh, maybe, first of all, it's challenging because of this close association uh, between this forgiveness that the first servant receives. It's this forgiveness of an infinite debt, an enormous debt, and that is closely associated with that servant's unmercifulness that he demonstrates to a fellow servant who owes him, well, far less, far less. And the reason that it's, it's sort of difficult to work your way through it is because you might conclude from this teaching on, the, on forgiveness that receiving Christ's grace and, and receiving forgiveness is conditional on something we do. You know, even the, the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, it, it makes it sound a little bit like that. Forgive us our debts. Okay, I want to be forgiven. As we, or we could change that. Because we. Forgive us our debts because we have forgiven those who have sinned against us, or we have already forgiven our debtors. But if we were to read it that way, that, that wouldn't be gospel, would it? That would really be sneaking in a work into our salvation. And Ephesians 2 says we're saved by grace alone. It's not as if you need to forgive everyone in your life before God will forgive you of your sins. Salvation is by grace alone. Now having said that, free grace does not negate the biblical fact that in some ways it can be said that our forgiveness is conditional. And I say that very carefully this afternoon. You see, God doesn't save everyone. He doesn't. Who does He save? Well, only those who confess their sins, who repent from their sins, who turn to Jesus in faith, embrace Him as Savior, and ask that their sins would be washed in His blood. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says that godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation. There's a sequence here. Of course, we understand from Ephesians 2 that, yes, even faith is a gift from God. It's all grace. But in a way, you could say it's conditioned through a certain sequence. And so coming back to, to Matthew chapter 18, Christ approaches the genuineness of an individual's forgiveness and salvation from a different angle 
the barometer of the second and great commandment. Now remember, this, this parable, it follows on the heels of a, of a discussion about what the right way of addressing sin is within a congregation. It's a teaching on church discipline, we say. And it's Peter's question in verses 21 and then the Lord's answer in verse 22 that leads into this parable. Peter says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Is there a limit to how much I need to forgive my brother? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say seven times, but 77 times. Now, Peter thought his magnanimous suggestion of of seven times the biblical number of fullness would immediately be applauded by Jesus, as if Jesus would suddenly just stand up and give him a, an ovation. A... But then Jesus blows it out of the water. He says, no, 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 77 times. Now, the specific number isn't the point. It's not as if you forgive 77 times and on the 78th, Too bad, you're out of luck. That's not how it works here. That's not the point. It's not meant to be taken literally. Christ intended to say that a believer's heart and a believer's life, it, it should be the aroma of Christ to God, the aroma of forgiveness. Our entire life, it should be the aroma of forgiveness to others. Everywhere we go, in Christ, our hearts should always have a posture that is ready to forgive. That's what he's saying. And if they're not, well, then there's a terrifying parable that follows here. You see, not only can our behavior barometrically reveal uh, the condition of our hearts, but Christ warns that if our hearts remain in that condition of of just unmercifulness, they they continue just uh, releasing this wretched and pugnacious, repulsive odor of unmercifulness, then it reveals, he says, that we were never united to Christ in the first place. It reveals that the fragrance of his sacrifice on the cross does not remove our stench before the Lord. Now, I don't take any pleasure in in saying it this afternoon, but there are some of you who are listening this afternoon. And this might be your fate. If you do not repent of your ways, if you do not repent of your unmerciful heart, if you do not turn in faith to Jesus, if you do not desire that your life becomes the fragrant aroma of forgiveness, not only to God, but to those people in your life. Your fate, according to the Bible, Matthew 18, is one of eternal damnation. Now, Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, is a verse that speaks about this. And it's a verse that should make all of us shudder. It should make all of us weep with grief. And it speaks about something rising, but it's not a fragrance, it's a smoke. And the Apostle John there pictures the eternity of people who are unmerciful and unforgiving, who are not united to Christ. And he says there, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now this is the teaching of Jesus himself in Matthew 18. This is the fragrant one speaking. And faithful believers throughout the centuries have always maintained that there is a direct connection between our forgiveness in the blood of Jesus and our willingness to forgive other people who have hurt us. Jesus, he saves us from our sins. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he raises us to new life, to walk in newness with him so that we can be a gospel aroma of Christ in this stinking world of toxic bitterness festering resentment and and putrid unmercy and and rancid cancel culture. 
I mean, why else does Paul exhort the Colossians in chapter 3, in, in those verses we read, in, in 12 through 14? Why, why would he say that then? Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. What are you to put on? Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Now the teaching is clear. The 17th century uh, English theologian Thomas Fuller said, He that cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he must pass himself. Uh, similarly, the Puritan preacher Thomas, and, uh, Thomas Watson, he said, A man may as well go to hell for not forgiving as for not believing. And finally, the late Welsh preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, remarked, the man who is truly forgiven and knows it is a man that forgives. Now, essentially, the Heidelberg Catechism says the same thing in, in Lord's Day 51. It asks in, in question 126, what's the fifth petition? And the answer is, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Here's the explanation. That is, for the sake of Christ's blood, do not impute to us wretched sinners any of our transgressions, nor the evil which still clings to us, as we also find this evidence of your grace in us, that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbor. Now, that's a bit of a clunky translation, in my opinion. And this past week, as I was looking at these uh, Lord's Days and studying this, this whole topic, I came across the Christian Reformed Church of North America, uh, their translation of this catechism or this Lord's Day. And, and I think it makes it clearer. It says there... Uh, what is required in the fifth petition, or what is the fifth petition? And there's the answer, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our, our debtors. That is, because of Christ's blood, do not hold against us, poor sinners that we are, any of the sins that we do or the evil that constantly clings to us. Forgive us just as we are fully determined, as evidence of your grace in us, to forgive our neighbors. Now let that sink in just for a moment. Now how many times in your life have you prayed the fifth petition? And did you realize what you were praying when you prayed it? Forgive us just as we are fully determined, as evidence of your grace in us, to forgive our neighbors. In other, in other words, either we're asking, and actually one thing we're not asking here in the Lord's Prayer is we're not asking to be justified from our sin. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, it commences with an address to our Father. The only way you can address God as Father is if you are already in Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your heart. Think of Galatians 4 and, and Romans chapter 8. So you're not asking to be justified, you're, you're forgiven. But when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're, you're praying uh, maybe a variation of one of these two things. Father, show me the same measure of grace and mercy that I'm willing to show to people who have hurt and injured me. Or we could turn it around, Father, help me to extend the same measure of grace and mercy to others that I have received from you. Now, this teaching is true, this teaching is, is not easy, is it? I'm sure there are, uh, there are hurts from the past in your life. I have hurts from the past myself. We have hurt people ourselves. C.S. Lewis uh, reflected on the difficulty that we have in, in forgiving others, and, and he remarked in a, in a pithy statement, he said, everyone who says, or everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea, until they have something to forgive. And that resonates in my heart today. Forgiveness is a wonderful idea until I've got to do it. You see, I think the truth is most of us are terrified to forgive other people. And maybe it's because we worry that we're going to be taken advantage of again, that we're going to be hurt by someone again. Or, or maybe some of us, it's, it, it's because we secretly love stewing in our bitterness. 
and resentment, and we've never truly experienced the joy and the freedom that forgiveness provides. Maybe for some of us uh, connected to that last thing, it's because secretly we think we're in a position of power when we don't forgive someone. They owe us something, and you're going to hold it above them for the rest of their life. And they can grovel before you, and it makes you feel good. I'm sure many of you have heard of Corey Timboom. Uh, she wrote a number of books about her experiences during the Second World War. She lost her sister in a concentration camp, and if I'm not mistaken, she lost her father in a concentration camp, and she writes extensively about the atrocities she experienced and saw. Humanly speaking, Corrie ten Boom had every reason to be filled with hatred and harbor that hatred toward the individuals who had done these things to her and her family. But her books don't speak like that. She gives off the fragrance of Christ, every page of her book. And so in one of her books, she writes, forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hate. It is the power that breaks the chains of bitterness and the shackles of selfishness. I like how she writes that because so often you think, again, it's a position of power when you don't forgive someone. And really it's a cancer that's eating away your, your heart and your soul. You're, you're rotting from the inside out. And you've been handcuffed to your resentment and hatred. But forgiveness sets a person free, uh, free from sin, free from the shackles of resentment, free from that damning cancer that grows in your heart. And it's for good reason that Ephesians 4 uh, speaks about this in, in verses 26 and 27, and then if we jump forward to verses 31 and 32, the Apostle Paul writes, be angry. It's okay to have a righteous kind of anger at things, but in your anger do not sin. He's quoting one of the Psalms. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Because you don't want to give an opportunity for the devil. Because sin will fester. And then if we go to verses 31 and 32, he writes, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. How many people have we slandered when we're angry at them? Be put away from you. Along with all malice. That's a, an intent to, to hurt people with words. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why? As God in Christ forgave you. Now, before we end, I, I should say a few needed words about what the gospel says about the dynamics of, of true forgiveness. You see, with these, without these truths steering our, our broken relationships, too many people have been re-victimized. Perpetrators have unjustly escaped consequences for their sins. Now, earlier I said that forgiveness from sin is conditioned on faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance from those sins. And even that is a gift of grace. I understand that. And so while the free offer of salvation is proclaimed to all nations, it's only those who with a believing heart accept the offer of the gospel, who truly find forgiveness from their sins. Uh, Lord's Day 23 is a, a, a Lord's Day about justification, and it asks, well, how are you righteous before God? And it says, only by true faith, and then it walks through what Jesus does, or di did and does, even though I'm a sinner and I continue to sin and all of these things, and then it ends off that Lord's Day, I can receive all these gifts if I accept it with a believing heart. So the gospel doesn't just extend forgiveness or proclaim forgiveness without a call to faith, without a call to repentance. So it's conditional. Well, that same paradigm, it applies to the human-human relationship. Just as the free offer of salvation in Jesus is sincerely and earnestly offered, think of Ken as a Dort, chapter 3, 4, article 8, so our hearts and our lives must sincerely be ready all the time to offer forgiveness to people who have hurt us. 
But at the same time, we should realize that all forgiveness, even at the human level, is conditional. It follows the pattern of the gospel. You know, I don't think it's healthy. I don't even think it's, it's biblical at all when someone claims that, you know, I've forgiven someone for what they've done to me. But they've never had a conversation with that person about what has happened. They've never heard that person truly uh, confess their sins and the hurts that they've inflicted on them. They've never heard that person repent of their sins. They've never heard that person ask, will you please forgive me for what I have done to you? To say I've forgiven someone for what they did when you haven't heard those words, it doesn't reflect the gospel paradigm, does it? Just as we are justified by grace alone on the necessary condition of faith alone, forgiveness between neighbors is also by grace alone, but it needs to follow those non-negotiable steps of, of confession and repentance alone. Of course, we are, we are called as believers to be the fragrance of Christ, meaning our hearts should be ready to extend forgiveness. And instead of festering bitterness and resentment, we are called to have hearts that surrender those things to the Lord, and we are ready to extend forgiveness. And, and it's true, God can change hearts. He can, he can work in people. Uh, repentance and forgiveness can take place. There are many, many beautiful stories of this taking place throughout history, maybe in your own life. But it remains true that there are consequences for our sin in this life, on this side of heaven. And to ignore those consequences, again, is not healthy. It's often not safe. In fact, it's downright foolish. For example, what if a convicted pedophile expressed genuine remorse for his sins of the past and how he had victimized people in the past. Well, the Bible assures us, and it might make us feel uncomfortable to hear this, that if he were to seek forgiveness from God, he would find it in the fragrant blood of Jesus Christ. And if he were also to sincerely confess his sins, and to repent of what he had done. And to seek forgiveness from his victims for what he had done and the pain he had caused them and the hurt he had caused them. One would hope, and this may not always happen, but one would hope that if his victims were believers, that in time, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they would be able to extend the fragrance of forgiveness to him for the pain that his abuse had caused. But that doesn't mean that a church should be quick to put that man in charge of the children's ministry. Ever, actually. It doesn't mean that the church should ever make that man an elder to be in a position of trust ever again. To do that, to have him unmonitored around minors or in positions of trust or anything like that, why would you put him into such a situation of temptation again? And furthermore, even if there is forgiveness that takes place, if there's sincere repentance and there's sincere forgiveness, the scars remain. We live in a world with so much brokenness, and to ignore that brokenness just causes more brokenness. Even if a person extends forgiveness, they will walk with a limp or more than a limp for the rest of their life for what's been done to them. And so in this particular case, the repentant abuser, if he was sincerely repentant, he would recognize and he would humbly accept the consequences of his past abuse, whatever that might be. In fact, for him to insist on his rights, I think, would reflect insincere repentance. Now, all of this is impossible for us to do. We can't do it in our own strength. By nature, we're not inclined to extend mercy to people who have hurt us. At the same time, I've been speaking frequently just about extending forgiveness to people who have hurt us, and and that's really the, the sense of this petition in the Lord's Prayer. 
But there's a flip side. What if you are the person who has caused hurt and damage to someone else in your life? Well, you can't just run and hide and expect the victim to do all the work here. If you're listening today, you're being called out to go and seek reconciliation, to confess your sins, to repent of your sins, to ask for forgiveness, to accept the consequences for what you've done. And that's also impossible in our own strength. And so in his grace and wisdom, the Lord Jesus teaches us to ask the Father to forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And really we're asking, dear Father, fill my life with the fragrance of Christ, the aroma of, of life to life. Give me a forgiving heart. Give me a penitent heart. Grant peace and, and reconciliation with those whom I've hurt. And make me ready and willing to forgive those who have hurt me, not seven times, but 77 times. May my whole life be the aroma of Christ. Amen. Well, let's sing in response from hymn 63, the stanzas or the verses 1, 6, and 8.